Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending for this uh, last session. We have the difficult role to uh, keep you awake after lunch. <laughs> but for that, I have five great speakers, so I'm not to wait. And also because uh, that will be very complementary to this morning. So this morning, we discussed about challenges, how uh, we can overcome them and what uh, has been done so far. And this afternoon, we will look forward and look at uh, what we can do more or what we can do uh, a bit better or different. And uh, I will introduce each speaker, one of the users uh, in, in the row. So just to uh, to give a very short overview of what we will do, we will go beyond in terms of time. So beyond the previous period of uh, 2014 to 2020, up to 2030, and also beyond the energy savings. So not only discussing energy efficiency, only, but uh, more looking at energy efficiency as a means to an end, uh, meaning that uh, for uh, that's one part of the discussion we had this morning uh, about SMEs that are not really uh, aware of energy efficiency issues or not prioritizing energy efficiency investments. So that's also one part of the discussion in the this afternoon. So how to make it more uh, strategic. Uh, energy efficiency investment for different type of uh, customers. And to start, uh, we will set the scene about what is uh, coming new with the ETL CAS. So uh, start, probably most of you are already aware of the change in the numbering. So this morning you heard about Article 7 uh, energy savings obligation. So forget about it now that it's Article 8. And Article 8 that was about energy audits, forget about it, now it's Article 11. And to give you more detail about that, uh, I call on stage uh, I didn't uh, the same from the uh, DJ. I think for example. Afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed a splendid lunch and you are all wide awake to hear now the regular <laughs> conditions <laughs> for the next presentations. Um, and first of all, let me thank you all to be here uh, and also online and also thank you to the organizers of this meeting. Uh, energy efficiency is still a key priority for the European, uh, European energy policy um, and therefore it's good to have so many of you here to, to push forward energy efficiency issues. Why is energy efficiency still uh, uh, key? Uh, in the European energy uh, politics. It is because it is necessary and essential for transforming the European economy uh, towards a sustainable future. Um, at the same time, uh, leaving no one behind and energy efficiency is key for a lot of initiatives within this Green Deal. The Green Deal is the basis also for the recast of the energy efficiency directive. I'm talking about later. Um, initiatives like uh, the climate law, the climate ambition uh, for 2030 and 50, it is also key for supplying the clean energy, affordable and secure energy for all. It is uh, essential for mobilizing industry and the circular economy and also for our buildings to run energy efficient and to renovate buildings. Um, and uh, in order to um, uh, Builds the Green Deal on stable foods, um, it is necessary to have a just transition, meaning leaving no one behind, and it is necessary uh, to have available the necessary financing and the necessary funds to finance the, the transition. In order to uh, run this Green Deal, in fact, a roadmap was developed, uh, proposing a lot of legal initiatives, legal new incentives, legal recasts, and the Fit for 55 package. This roadmap consists of a set of interconnected proposals that strike a balance between, um, on the one hand, pricing, standards, and support measures in order to achieve the energy and climate targets uh, proposed in the Green Deal. And uh, the Energy Efficiency Directive is one cornerstone of this big puzzle according to reach the targets of the Green Deal. So we are talking now in my presentation, I'm talking now about one small cornerstone of the whole picture. 
And uh, the whole picture doesn't finish uh, with the 55 package because, as you all know, uh, beginning of 2022, uh, uh, Europe was facing a, a, a severe war in Europe and uh, this war changed dramatically our energy world. Um, whole Europe is facing uh, price instabilities, rising prices, supply crises uh, for Russian fossil fuels, and therefore a new initiative was uh, brought to life, the Repower EU. Um, Repower EU um, is with its target to phase out the dependency on Russian fossil fuels by, on the one hand, diversifying energy sources, reducing demand for energy, and accelerating the clean energy transition. And um, here we have a lot of important uh, measures that um, bring us to fulfill this target or to reach this target. It is on the one hand in the renewable, on the renewable side, increase of uh, the renewable target from 40% to 45% by 2030, and for energy efficiency importing also an increase from the 9% target you find in the Fit for 55 package towards 13% in 2023. And this is the basis for the Energy Efficiency Directive recast I'm now talking about. What is this recast about? It is in a nutshell on more ambitious targets and on new instruments. So the recast should bring these more ambitious targets for 2030 and uh, new instruments um, that um, build in these targets that try and help to fulfill these targets. You see here the five key cornerstones of the new energy efficiency directive. Uh, you already know all of these cornerstones, but they are more stringent, they are more ambitious, and new instruments are added. On the one hand, uh, you already know the energy efficiency first principle. This principle has been stringent in the new uh, directive, in the recast of the directive, um, meaning that uh, all the European countries have to take uh, care of energy efficiency whenever they implement, whenever they plan new policies, whenever they measure uh, investment decisions, then this energy efficiency first principle has to be taken into account. Um, second, it is on uh, binding European energy efficiency targets and indicative national contributions. I will come to that later. It is on uh, strengthening the energy savings obligation in end use. So the energy obligation system is more ambitious on the one hand, the targets are raised, and it is more stringent because, uh, for example, monitoring and verification mechanisms are um, stronger and much more clear than before. Uh, the role of the public sector is uh, stronger now in the recast. And we have focus on energy poverty, on alleviating energy poverty, of course, and on consumer empowerment. So these are the, the major cornerstones of the new recast. And I will concentrate now on targets. Ambitious targets, it is in the new Article 4. Ambitious targets mean, uh, on the one hand, 9%, as I said, in Fit for 55 package. On the other hand, the 13% in Repower EU. And what you find now in the read cast is 11.7%. So it's not the average of 9 and 13, it's slightly towards the more ambitious line of the, of the range. Uh, it is 11.30%, meaning a reduction um, compared to a forecast made in 2020, the Prime's 2020 scenario for 2030, for the energy consumption in 2030, minus 11.7%. So it's more ambitious than the Fit for 55 package. It's a little bit less ambitious than the uh, Green Power EU target. Um, this target is not only for final energy consumption, but also for primary energy consumption. So for both, minus 11.7. And as I said, it's, an, uh, uh, it's a binding target on the European level, but it's indicative on the national level. Uh, but member states have collectively have to take care that they collectively, with their national uh, contributions, that they collectively reduce in the, uh, in the magnitude of the required binding European target, the energy consumption. So it's a collective approach to reach the target, the binding target. Mm -hmm. um, what about the new instruments, Article 8 and Article 11? Uh, Article 8, uh, as Jean-Sébastien already said, is the old uh, Article 7. It is about the energy efficiency obligation. 
Uh, on the one hand, we also have here a, a, a raising target, a more ambitious target. It is now nearly double as high as it was before. Now you find on average, a target average about the period uh, till 2030, on average, a target of 1.49% per year, uh, increasing energy efficiency potential. So it's nearly doubled. Um, with a stepwise approach, meaning that we start now with 0.8% as in the existing directive, and it slightly raises to 1.9% beginning of 2028. So a stepwise approach and on average, 1.49% per year should be done for energy efficiency. This is not the only thing, the more ambitious target. In Article 4, the energy efficiency obligation system, the new Article 8, you also find uh, new provisions, stronger, strengthened provisions on monitoring and verification. Member states now need to explicitly demonstrate that a measure they implement, that a new measure they are implementing um, is implemented with the purpose, or at least one of the purposes for this measure is to reduce energy consumption, is to uh, comply with the energy efficiency obligation. So not any measure is uh, eligible under this uh, obligation. You really have to demonstrate as a member state that this is a measure to save energy. This is, uh, th this is one uh, clarification. Another clarification that is made from my point of view, very important is um, that energy savings, according to the public sector provisions, meaning uh, the new Article 5 and Article 6, um, the refurbishment of public buildings provision, and also the reduction of the public energy consumption provision, that savings due to these two articles and provisions are eligible under the energy efficiency obligation. So you can count energy savings in public sector, of course, only you can count if these savings are final energy savings, and if they are according to the Annex 5, to the Annex uh, stating uh, what uh, criteria, what conditions need to be complied with for uh, uh, eligible energy savings. If these savings comply with the provisions, then they are, uh, then they can be uh, uh, counted as energy savings also for the obligation system. Um, we have new provisions in this uh, energy efficiency obligation system according to fossil fuels. Um, and this is really new from my point of view, meaning that uh, in future, whenever you implement a measure, energy savings measure uh, related to technologies that burn fossil fuels, uh, be aware that it probably is not eligible under the energy efficiency obligation. Um, if it's a new policy measure, if it's implemented after a certain time, it might be not eligible anymore. There are exemptions from this provision um, exemptions for industry, for enterprises in industry sector, but there are heavy conditions on that. Let's say, for example, um, uh, enterprises that would claim that would like to claim for energy savings uh, related to their combustion technologies, fossil fuel combustion technologies, they have to do an energy audit. Uh, the uh, payback times, for example, of those measures needs to be uh, more than five years, and so on. So a lot of uh, quite severe provisions on that and in future take sorry it's too fast and in future it has to be taken care of whether these um, measures are eligible or not. Another um, new thing in, in the energy efficiency obligation system is that um, according to the target of the Green Deal to realize a just transition, we also implemented a share to be fulfilled or a share of energy savings um, to be implemented within a priority group of energy poor households, vulnerable customers, low income households. So in order to guarantee that the transition, the energy transition is a just transition, also implement energy efficiency saving measures within those priority groups. A certain share has to be defined by the member states and here the member state has a, a quite broad freedom on how defining this share, uh, but this share then has to be realized, energy savings in the magnitude of this share have to be realized within the priority groups. Article 11, the energy audits. This is the new 
uh, Article 8 uh, on energy audits and management systems. Also, a lot changed in this energy uh, audit obligation. It's not anymore an energy audit obligation. It's more or less an energy management system obligation because uh, uh, we go for uh, energy management systems that must be implemented. And it is not an obligation for big companies as so far, not for the companies with a lot of uh, employees and high turnover rates. It is now for energy intensive companies, meaning that there is a threshold of 85 terajoules energy consumption on average uh, for the last three years. Um, and if a company consumes more than this 85 uh, terajoules, um, an energy management system is obligatory. If the company consumes less than this threshold, but more than 10 terajoules, an energy audit is mandatory. So in future, we have a distinction between two different types of energy intensive industries. Uh, one has to deliver an energy audit, the smaller ones deliver an energy audit, and the big ones, the intensive ones, deliver energy management systems not depending on whether this is an SME or not. So the size of the company is not a question anymore. It's only the energy intensity of the company. Yes, I think this is this, this, this is the main the, the main issue on the energy audit obligation, the main change in the energy obligation uh, system we made. Um, perhaps uh, some words more on, on SMEs and, and on energy management and energy audits. Uh, still, we have some SMEs who consume, who are not uh, energy intensive companies, who consume less than 10 terajoules. What are we doing? What are we supporting with these, uh, for these uh, companies? And here we have a provision uh, in the directive saying that um, member states should support SMEs that are not obliged by energy audits or energy management systems. And you find in the directive a uh, list uh, of uh, possible uh, measures instrument to support such as networking for those companies, um, a hub uh, for um, uh, SMEs to support them and also support the market for energy services and also make uh, uh, available methodologies, instruments for SMEs to evaluate, to assess the multiple benefits of, of um, energy audits, of energy savings measures for SMEs. This is from our point of view, an important um, instrument to make aware um, the broader benefits companies, not only companies, but also member states and, and households um, have from the implementation of energy efficiency measures and from the implementation um, of energy savings, um, of, of energy saving measures. Yes, I think this is the most important on article, uh, new article 8 and 11. And uh, not to forget, we have much more in our pocket to uh, support the energy transition. We have other key initiatives. Um, I take first the revision of the energy performance buildings directive very important a long-term vision to uh, uh, become our buildings net zero uh, buildings, net zero emission buildings um, is under preparation now, is quite forward. Uh, the revising renewable energy directive also very important um, uh, key initiative uh, for the energy transition, nearly far uh, in the process as the energy efficiency directive. And then we have the revision of the electricity market design um, accelerating especially uh, the, the um, um, renewable and, and fossil, the, the um, use of renewable energy and the phase out of fossil fuels uh, and also better protection uh, of, cons uh, of consumers and um, to uh, fight against price volatilities. The Net Zero Industry Act I think is also well known and uh, to finance, to provide this financing issue, uh, we have a sustainable finance and, uh, and unlocking private financing framework that is under development. So these are the related key issues to the energy efficiency directive we are now uh, working on on the European level. Co-legislators are intensively discussing, hopefully becoming very soon uh, in force in order to uh, provide an adequate background for the energy transition. Thank you very much.
Any question from the video agents? Maybe just one that's it. Probably some are thinking about it, but they are too shy. So <laughs> they don't look shy. <laughs> so could you give us a, a bit an idea about when the, the final EV is be uh, published? Um, roughly, roughly. I, I don't ask for it. Roughly, roughly. Yes, it's it's. Um, I mean, for the EED, the process is uh, uh, quite clear and 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 forward. Um, because um, we had um, uh, we had a confirmation in the ITRE in, in Parliament, we already have. We are now waiting for the vote in Parliament uh, that should take place second week of July. Um, so it is expected to take place in the second week of July and then the Council um, is expected to vote end of July, um, meaning that 20 days after uh, meaning that the publication can then start. We expect that the publication of the directive is in autumn, September perhaps, so September perhaps publication. 20 days after publication then, uh, directive uh, enters into force and then member states have two years to transpose. So that's the, that's the plan for the energy efficiency directive. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this guy's also useful, especially for the ones who will be transposing them later, so then okay, get ready. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we we got from your message that uh, there will be more ambition, but also that uh, we need uh, tailored approaches, or let's say, think about the approaches according to different target groups and so on. And now we will move to the general expense with the development of the ESCO market, and I'm quite sure, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, Rudy Garloze from Benet will tell us a bit about that, what, uh, what we learn and uh, how to take into account the, the actual needs of the customers. Definitely, Sebastian. Thank you very much for having me here and uh, warm welcome also from my side. So ESCO, is, um, everybody familiar with that? ESCO Energy Service Company. So I, I think um, if, if you're still a bit shy, it, I, I do pre-explain it. So it's just uh, guys who companies, large companies who carry out what, what is coming from example ED, but also from EPVD uh, with regard to the um, safe execution, financing, also, you know, also making uh, additional capacities available. So that's that's what um, escrows can do in this in this provision. And uh, for me, it's a uh, since 25 years a high interesting high interesting topic which I think it's it's pretty valuable and we need it in, in Germany especially we have a lot of SMEs in the industrial sector so we have um, a lot of SMEs which always say when we have meetings we have so many webinars introducing them into new regulations and stuff and we get the feedback this is all too complex this is all too expensive we cannot do it we have no clue where to start and where to end so I think this this is something where ESCO can fit in perfectly well because they are ready to um, solve complexities and they are ready to be a servant for those companies and also for building owners not being capable to carry out the stuff by themselves. Just to have a view on that, maybe you are familiar with those European ESCO um, market reports. So. Germany is considered one of the mature markets um, in this in this context. So we have a, a quite okay legislation. We will see later on that how it really is. It's about 10 billion per year. And uh, what we can say uh, is that it's stagnating over years because uh, federal government and also our regional governments are not really informed, well informed about the possibilities and options they can have. But also we have not uh, a level playing field on the legal level. So that's something which keeps us from going. Um, we have the factor four in, 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 in our vision. So we have quite clear that instead of eight to 10 billion, it could be just factor four. And this is valuable investment into the energy efficiency and of course then in the decarbonization of our economics. So I've set up a kind of uh, small, small lineup which condenses uh, all that what we learned from, I could say personally from my side, from 2015 on when we had a European Investment Bank project where we promised 
to uh, implement um, ESCO projects into the public sector. Public sector, you can say, okay, this is specific, this is uh, a niche, uh, this is not so highly re relevant. If you look at the EED, I'm glad that EED turns on those public sectors because they have a lot of things to do and EED helps them to set priorities for energy efficiency as well. So what we see um, and also what is uh, coming back on us uh, right away in the last year, year is that we have dramatic disruptive changes in the energy market. So that means it's already mentioned increasing prices, volatilities, not available energy formats, and that is um, creating a kind of huge challenge, but it also is a huge option, of course, for those providing so those solutions, because those problems coming up have to be solved anyway. So, and that get to the, the, um, the idea more or less quickly, um, you will see soon which companies I'm talking about, um, that ESCO business is not the standard stuff we had in the past 20 years, which were more or less two sorts of standard business models. So you can have a kind of utility. So you deliver heating or cooling or lighting or whatsoever, but you deliver something, but you don't care about the consumption itself. You just do it efficiently. And you have, on the other hand, the, uh, the second um, energy performance contract, which is quite uh, well payable in, in the context of the EED, but it has only a market share of 10, 15% in our market in this case. So what is going here is that we have a change of, um, uh, of the needs. And what we uh, see from there is that the ESCOs um, have learned at least in the last 12 months and that they have to change their approaches. It's not those classical models. It's it's just the way forward to look on the demands and the needs of the customers. We will dive into that a bit. What are the customer needs, especially in the building sector and also the industry? It has changed definitely in the last 12 months, and I give you an insight on the national uh, on the national side. So, what we have on on our to do list is to listen to the users potential users, understand that they have technical complexity to solve, that they have organizational complexity to solve, and that they have, of course, the huge amount of finance to be pulled up and to be invested in those types of projects, um, which lead to the decarbonization of industries and, of course, the building stock. So this is completely different from that what we talked about one minute ago. It's not just a classical where you have a guideline number 108 and you can look it up, it's, it's a kind of toolbox. So you need to be quite flexible and it's a totally different game. And it will lead to the point that some of those companies will pass away from the market. They will not be existent. Um, those being static, not being able to change their business will disappear. So um, and our bunch of people, as you know, I'm, I'm representing a small association of ESCOs. Those are guys who are with us, and we try them also to indicate as early as possible what's coming up and what's relevant for them for the, in the context of their strategy. And what we did since 2021, uh, honestly, is to put inside for them, okay, heat pump is coming up, electrification of uh, the heating sector, huge st uh, stuff in, in Germany since we learned that Russian gas is cheap, but uh, it's bloody. So then we also uh, learned that um, efficiency is one of the first things to do. Efficiency first seems to be a kind of simplicity, but it's not, it's not given. It's complex. It's much easier to promote renewables and just put something in place and replace other energies. It's something different. So in this combination, efficiency first, as a business model, and then supply based on renewables. That's what what actually is is needed. And what ours, I don't want to dive into that today. But what typically an association does, of course, is political framework. And the most important thing here is that you see we have in Germany not still accomplished what is demanded in the EEC. Still, after years, not is that we have a level playing field for all kind of actors in our market. That means. If somebody is carrying out a, a, a decarbonization measure by itself, a company, whatever, it it's, has easier access to funding sources, to in, incentives, whatever, and it's not 
fair. It's discriminative. And so we are working now within the energy efficiency legislation, which is hugely discussed in Germany because people are inside to reduce their demand. Oh my goodness, that that we try to implement this kind of level playing field here on this on this on this market sector. So that's to come back to your 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 topic from this morning. I, I thought it was very interesting what you presented, uh, but I have also some insights from my role, uh, my former role as a project developer, having developed more than 100 um, energy performance contracts and energy supply contracts within um, the southwest region of Germany in the public sector, and the housing sector, but also the industry. So what we see here is that we have a change in the demand side of, of our users. So industry has looked for, on low hanging fruits in the past, but it's not going anymore. They have a clear path. They have to set up decarbonization pathways. This is also incentivized by the national government since two years, and it's well demanded, it's well looked on. And um, from this perspective, just to pick one of those, they have a totally different demand. So they need somebody who takes them by the hand and goes that long way from the first concept, then to the detailed planning design, also to the financial plan, totally to the very end, to the implementation, monitoring, verification, operation, and of course, maintenance and all that stuff. That's, as you know, is the classical um, uh, um, business model uh, with the classical uh, values, which you used to indicate, but um, it has changed with the targets. The targets are totally different. No more low hanging fruits, just go into the decarbonization at the latest 2030, 2035, or 2045 at Ultimo. And that means that some of those old school, I would say, I, I'm a bit provocative, sorry, right now, but I need to, to, to keep you going uh, one minute still. Um, this has led to a totally different approach on the MB. The monitoring and verification was carried out in the past very sincerely. It was carried out based on, on smart meters. It was done exactly. It was done two dots after the comma. It was really after two weeks of discussion, you just discussed the 0.25%, which should be not paid to the ESCO, but should stay with the building owner. This was a huge discussion and it was something very important also for the customers. Why? It has changed dramatically in the past as the targets, the needs, the customer needs, that's what I try to emphasize here, has changed. It's more bottom up, it's totally different. So we see that uh, it's, it's still important to have for the energy purchase, for the energy, sorry, for the, for the energy supply and also for the energy storage, it's still important to have smart meters and detailed analysis of your hourly uh, or, or on the second uh, demand and also on your uh, availability of different uh, levels of energy, electricity or heating or gas, whatever. But it does not play a much, or it does play a much lower priority in the business model itself. Other values have overcome those values which have been important in the past. So the, the accuracy on the on the two dots after the comma have been replaced by long-term partnership, by trust, by going together a long time, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years up from the very first start until the implementation with guarantee of the targets with a guaranteed decarbonization. That's that's what what we um can can see or what it detail is and in detail means is that we have those five percent of tolerance in our our standard contracts more or less or in some of the standard contracts which means we look on on a broader on a broader line do we within 10 years or 15 years meet those targets plus minus five percent then it's okay five percent two percent three percent we also left away the penalty we had the situation that escrows have been penalized. They did not meet the targets they have promised. So in combination with that, it gives them a more uh, level of trust-based cooperation than another one in, in the past. And we have also very important, if you look on, on, on let's say, large investment, 
we have mutual maintenance funds, which is a huge factor because this is the second uh, investment. And the second investment means after 10 years, 15 years, when the technical usage time is over, you have to reinvest. And that's typically a, a case for the ESCO. And uh, it has been always not so transparent. And to create those trust scenarios and those transparency, we uh, are now promoting um, neutral maintenance finance pools. So we are pretty optimistic to come to the end. We are pretty optimistic that we are able within the uh, redesign of the classical business model within the mixture of classical business models towards the needs of the customer. We are pretty confident that we can meet and help really to move forward with the decarbonization in buildings and in the industry. Thanks a lot, Rudika. Uh, I don't know if we have uh, direct questions from, from the audience. Anyone was shocked by the, the proposition to change from a complex system to more trust? Yeah. <laughs> or are you all welcome to see your approach? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 So this is Laura from Sojeska, I'm going to present later on. I have a question regarding the contractual side of this, because I know that contracts in ESCO are a big deal. So now that the perspective has changed, that has been or it is something that is going to happen to be a lot of work on the contracts, like on the EPC contracts, they have to change a lot and make different contracts more flexible with different clauses. So how Matches the burden on the leaders. Thank you for that question. It's a very interesting. We had yesterday that picture. We talked just exactly about that. If you now look on an ESCO uh, site where an ESCO works, so let's say some of the ESCO, you look at the building and you you go there in the middle of the night, maybe two a.m., and there's lights on. This is the legal department. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but it's it's um, it's more in a way that you have a kind of toolbox. That's what I meant with toolboxes, so that you can pick from there because the contracts already exist. What is going on is that you reduce the inherited which the risks, which you really need to prove totally exactly after the two dots after the comma. It's a higher risk, so it's easier to lower down this approach, but then go into longer partnerships. That, that is a different risk. So you need to consider maintenance and re-maintenance measures. So maybe you have a 20 years contract. So not only one maintenance cycle is uh, relevant, but also the second one. Um, but uh, in general, it, it's quite positive because um, now we have the financial sector streaming there and say, oh, this is ESG. Oh my goodness, this is taxonomy. Let's go there. And so they are quite glad that those kind of risk of the performance is in a kind of uh, threshold, which is not so hard, because that's easier for them to understand. Yeah, thank you. I actually have the same question. Yeah, we can continue and we're at the end. So thanks a lot. So you even introduce yourself. Well, I had to. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, as I said, I am Laura Van from Sudeska. Uh, we are partner of the ESMA, technical partners. I'm going to show you um, three of the tools that we have developed uh, in our projects that do exactly go in the direction that we have been talking about uh, throughout the day today. Uh, so uh, the ESMA, in fact, suggests approaching the energy efficiency from a strategic so we know where we want to go, we know that we want to push more companies, particularly SMEs, to carry out audits. And we have just heard that the new directive is also heading in the direction of having more energy management systems. So recognizing the multiple benefits associated with energy efficiency is, in this case, as we have approached uh, the project and our tools based on the analysis of the company business model. So basically what did we do? We developed the uh, three um, tools 
that uh, are the multiple benefits approach to energy audit. So uh, the formal uh, traditional energy audit is enriched with the multiple benefits. The energy management system supporting the multiple benefits approach and also an Excel tool, so a tool to uh, analyze the energy efficiency investments, including uh, the recognition of the economic value of the multiple benefits. So the first one is the multiple benefits approach to the energy auditing. Basically, uh, this approach combines the analysis of the business model with the energy efficiency. So it takes into consideration relating the energy efficiency decisions together with achieving the general business objective of the company and introduced the concept of energy efficiency and sustainability in the analysis of the business model. Step by step, so initially you have the analysis of the business model, you know, the traditional business model canvas of your company, and then you go into analyzing the structure. So this is the business analysis. Then you go to the energy side, step three and four, so energy audit, and analysis of the carbon footprint. And then you go beyond. The step beyond that we have taken with our project is taking into account the multiple benefits, the non-energy benefits that you can have when, when you invest in energy efficiency. And evaluating, giving also a money value to these multiple benefits. The last phase closing the circle is advancing the business model. That means having a business model improved, including the, the uh, uh, multiple benefits. So this is it. It is the same as before. Just for reference, I put the uh, green circles with the numbers that refer to the parts that I uh, just mentioned in the slide uh, before. So the DSM methodology can be seen as a life cycle that begins and ends with the business model analysis. And this is both a diagnostic and strategic tool. So, so each iteration cycle leads to improved levels of energy efficiency and business model sustainability through improvement and innovation. So as I said, you analyze the business model that means general understanding of the business context and rationale, then environmental analysis, so analysis of the energy use, understanding of the environmental impact, then you relate this to the multiple benefits, and then you advance your business model, taking into account the multiple benefits. And what you have as a result is this integrated multiple benefits approach. So at the end, you, you know that very well, uh, that's a, a business model canvas. It's written very small, but inside we have added to the key partners, activities, and all the other bits and pieces of the canvas, those multiple benefits. A list is included on the right-hand side of the slide. Just to give you an example, you can have reduced maintenance costs because of improved energy efficiency, or you can have uh, like reduced waste, or you can have uh, acquisition of more customers because customers nowadays more and more look at how green you are. And to some extent, companies are also forced to go in that uh, direct nose direction, or you can have improved relationship with your partners. Even small companies nowadays are asked by the suppliers to be compliant with you know the new uh, sustainable targets and directives and so on so this is the idea the first tool that we developed uh, in the asthma to prompt uh, companies particularly smes to do the energy audit not only because of saving money but also because of the multiple benefits associated with all this Second is also approaching the energy management system with a multiple benefit approach. This is not an integrated management system, but is an integrated approach. 
That means that when you think about an integrated management system, it's a system that manages different aspects of an organization according to different standards. Whether we are talking about a company that decides to implement an energy man management system like ISO 50001 and includes multiple benefits that are not mandatory, but at company discretion so far. I don't know whether one day they become mandatory. Uh, so, of course, there's no certification applied to the multiple benefits. However, it helps to define other KPIs to be uh, monitored and used in the extended energy management system. So this is basically an energy management system that intends to manage the implementation of multiple benefits approach whose scope includes the multiple benefits. And as anticipated by, I think, Ivana this morning, we are working, uh, we are also participating to the drafting of a new standard that is the or including multiple benefits. So again, uh, it's uh, the application of the multiple benefits to the uh, Deming cycle. The approach suggests managerial and operational solutions to keep the multiple benefits aspects under management control and improvement over time. That means that when you plan, you have to include, for example, environmental issues, uh, health and safety issues, other KPIs related to multiple benefits in uh, your planning activities, and then also include the multiple aspects uh, in the uh, training, procedure, communication, control, design, procurement, so when you act. And then in the monitoring, monitoring the KPI related to multiple benefits, and eventually when you review, you have to take into account the additional uh, measures of the multiple benefits. It is important also that to, to think strategically that companies that already have other management systems could take advantage in applying the multiple benefits approach to the energy management system. And the opposite is also true, assessing uh, management of non-energy aspects in the energy management system can facilitate implementation of other standards. So that's why you see on the left hand side the arrow does, the arrow does, that goes in both directions. On the other hand, the approach uh, and extended energy management system can help companies to meet the obligation that are gradually introduced by the European policy in support of the environmental sustainability. We know that now there is a lot going on on taxonomy, CSR, um, non-energy uh, non benefit, um, sorry, sustainable balance and, and so on. So, this goes all supporting companies thinking strategically in that direction. Finally, we also developed a tool to let's talk more about money because you know when the, the business manager takes decision, they want to know, yes, I'm doing this because it's nice, but also where is the return? So we have developed an Excel tool, which is like a normal business model, uh, business analysis tool with all the cash flows of investing in various efficiency measure, measures, targeting the companies uh, uh, that we have involved in this specific case in the energy audits of the project. It's an Excel spreadsheet and it covers uh, like introduction on how it works and then specification on the investment you're going to make. Like, for example, I'm going to change all my engines or I'm going to install a cogenerator or I'm going to change all the lighting system or the air or the, sorry, um, compressed air systems and so on. And what you get at the end, you get what you see here is the cover, but is also the results. So you will have the main economic uh, results without taking into account the non-energy benefits and taking into account the non-energy benefits. 
So you're going to have like in this uh, specific example of like 6,000 euro investments or very small investments, payback time with and without taking into account uh, non-energy benefits, internal rate of return, net present value, net present value divided by investment and the cost of energy save. I browsed through the Excel that is behind here last night to see where the calculation came from because I did not do it personally. And in fact, it was taking into account the reduction in uh, maintenance costs. That's what made the difference between uh, taking and not taking into account the multiple benefits. So this is the same as only made bigger for your reference. So this is what we did in practical terms and what we are actually using in the framework of the project when approaching the companies. This is it. This is our partners. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Laura. Any questions for you? I have one. Um, because you, you mentioned that you monetize the impacts, but do you think that sometimes that's also okay and the message is already clear if you just present the impact as it is without uh, monetizing, depending on the type of impact? For it certainly is. Uh, for the reasons that I was explaining to you earlier, there are some multiple benefits yes. that you cannot monetize, but of course, those that we could give a number to uh, would be more appealing from the people that make these decisions. Because I think this requires also a change in mentality, which is coming from the bottom, but also of course from the top, because the European Union and the world is leading us towards a sustainability direction. So, you know, I think that if you approach the, the CFO of a company and only say they spend one million because it's nice, uh, he, would, he wouldn't do it. Or maybe if he's illuminated, I mean, if I say to him that he's going to look green and have more clients and and his employees are going to be happier. But if you translate that into numbers as far as possible, I think they're going to like it more. So it's, it's more appealing. This is what we were trying to do as much as possible. Okay. Thank you very much. And now we are turning to the Netherlands. And uh, please to uh, welcome to the stage Jorike uh, Ishaf from the Dutch uh, Agency for Enterprises. And we will learn that there have been a big change in their policy. Probably some of you were aware of their voluntary agreements. That's, that was a policy that were there for a long time and uh, often presented as a success. So happy to hear what is coming next. Thank you very much. My name is Jerry Grinza from Airbio. Um, and uh, as Jean Sebastian said, I will tell you some, uh, I'll give you some more details to switch that has been made in the Netherlands recently um, from policies, national policies in terms of energy efficiency, especially for uh, businesses and industries. First, um, I will give you a short history. Um, about the voluntary agreements from 2006. Uh, for many years, the energy efficiency policy in industry and business sectors was based on these voluntary agreements. Um, we had thousands of industrial and service sec um, participants in 40 sectors in total that were relatively energy intensive. Um, so we had, for example, paper industry, pet food, uh, refineries, hospitals, this kind of sectors were involved. And th those, those uh, thousands of participants had to um, hand in energy efficiency plans every four years. And uh, it was pretty much on a voluntary basis, but we, we checked those plans and we validated them. And uh, after this yearly, uh, a quite extensive monitoring report, but, but we handed in as well for participants. Um, in exchange, uh, there were sectoral, there was some sectoral knowledge exchange and support from the governments, and in some cases also some financial benefits. 
we had actually two agreements. Um, we had a MDR, Mirjavenafspraken, which is uh, which was the agreement for the, the ninety percent of the participants, but not the large energy users. That was was a separate agreement, and they had made um, uh, in the start of the agreement they had made a target. They they said we want to have twenty percent process efficiency in twenty twenty. Uh, that was by then quite um, ambitious, I think. Uh, <laughs> nowadays we think a bit uh, differently about it. Um, so you see the yellow uh, small line, that is the 20% 20, 20 process efficiency, and we mean with process efficiency all energy efficiency, uh, energy efficiency uh, within the company, so excluding renewable production, excluding product chain, um, uh, product chain efficiency. So it's the red parts of the graph. Um, the target was already met in, I think, 2016. And uh, in 2020, it was met at 27%. So you could say it's quite successful. Um, the other agreement was the May agreement that was um, for energy intensive larger users, mainly EU ETS participants. Uh, they did not have a such a target and they had they ended with a result in 12% in 2020 for process efficiency. And this is all cumulative and in relation to your own energy use. So you can say uh, it is a success, you can say it's not such a success. Um, at least uh, the Dutch politics didn't think in the end it was a success. They think they thought, especially for the larger energy users, they thought, well, the low hanging fruit is now picked already. Uh, we have ambitious, much more ambitious climate targets. So we uh, we need to, to find other uh, policies for this. And we, we uh, finalize the agreements in 2020. They agreed about this. However, it was a good base to have um, to monitor the EED Article 7, which is now Article 8. So the voluntary agreements were had really well monitored energy saving data. Um, and also in such a detail that we managed to uh, correct overlap with other uh, data from other instruments as well. So this is, uh, I won't go into mu too much detail, but it is uh, in the red uh, box, you see the uh, uh, the palace shoes that were coming from uh, agreements. And below, you can see we managed to have uh, 672 cumulative um, um, was reached and the target for this period was 482. However, meanwhile, and excuse me for the title, <laughs> because um, I now believe energy saving obligation is, is the title. Of, I now know it's really the title of the article. I'm sorry. I, uh, but it's also a, a direct translation of the energy, energy besparing split. It's in Dutch and it already existed in 1993. It was included in law, so you have to do something with energy efficiency, but it was not at all um, enforced. And in 2008, they decided we um, we defined something about this. So we defined all measures are obliged uh, with payback, payback time, a simple payback time of less than five years. But also after this, nothing happened. Um, and then in 2013, it was agreed that enforcement must be done by local authorities. They got some, some budget, I think, by then, a little bit. But also then it was very difficult to implement this enforcement. Um, there were some active local authorities who did this, but not so much. So then they decided to have in 2019, the information obligation. 
a special regulation that is related to the energy saving obligation. Uh, that means that uh, all uh, companies with a certain energy use above 50,000 megawatt hour or 20,000 uh, cubic meter natural gas use, they had to um, fill in checklists. Um, we, there were made checklists for 90 sectors, recognized checklists, so they were just by then um, developed with the current energy prices and investment costs uh, for this five year payback time. And um, they had to check, uh, just check the checklist. Um, and there was some financial support for local authorities as well. And in the last, well, between 2019 and 2022, we had 60,000 60, of these reports out of estimated 90,000 reports uh, submitted. However, those were checklists and it was in the on the level like uh, did you apply um, uh, LED uh, light bulbs or so you could not have better shoes of this. So for the monitoring, it was not so, uh, so nice. Um, as I already told you that in 2020, the end the, the, the agreements uh, were finalized. Um, and the agreements were earlier a way for to as an exemption to be exempted for the information obligation. But when it finalized automatically, the, the a large part of the thousand participants had to be uh, had to do the information obligation as well. But now in 2023, uh, it was decided that to enlarge the target group by energy intensive industries, um, greenhouse horticulture, permit holders. So uh, a very large target group uh, with large saving potentials. Um, and also the scope was widened. So now they need next to energy savings also uh, take into account renewable production and electric electrification. And also there's uh, a pretty large budget uh, available for more enforcement in the coming years. Also the 19 sectoral lists are changed from into two, three category lists. It's in Dutch, uh, but it is for buildings, facilities and processes. Um, and even more important maybe, um, for the larger energy uses with certain energy levels, a research obligation is, um, uh, is had to be uh, had to be handed in as well, and this will start uh, first in December this year. And also a change that was made is that from 2027, uh, the maximum payback time is stretched from five to seven years. So besides, we have. Other instruments, uh, energy investment tax, uh, and and other big financial instruments, and they provide us data to um, next to the uh, obligations to uh, include uh, to exclude the overlap. So to do this overlap correction for the Article uh, Eight Seven Slash Eight to be eight um, after this. But we have to we have to change a bit uh, some things because data now is only available on the level of checklist. So uh, if an enterprise did take the measure, it's only uh, just little quantitative information, of course. So for next round, we intend to collect extra data to be able to calculate savings from bottom up and use assumptions and to use assumptions in line with current method methods for other instruments as well, um, and to make sure that. The data is more su suitable for, for um, yeah, the, the, the correct thing of the overlap. So, so my conclusions is um, we have a shift from the voluntary agreements to energy saving obligations, and they expect it to be quite impactful because of the larger target group and also the enforcement, which will be um, there. There is a lot of capacity for it now. Um, but it, it will be a monitoring challenge and 
from the relative extensive reports we had to uh, many more reports with little information. So how to collect the essential data is, uh, is a challenge. And meanwhile, other instruments um, provide quantitative data for uh, Article 8, uh, but in most, in most cases, the, the quality is good, so we can do this overlap correction in the calculations as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rekha. Any question from the students? You, you need to wait very well to that. Otherwise, I, I would have just one clarification. You, may, you mentioned the budget of uh, 60, 15 or 56 million euros. Yes. So just to be sure, that's the money that goes to the local authorities to implement and to enforce, let's say, the, the scheme, right? Yes. That's not the incentives for the companies. To... No, it's not a financial uh... And does it mean that this uh, amount will be used, for example, for the monitoring, for including the monitoring? Um, I'm not sure. It's, it's especially meant for enforcement. Okay, and like uh, controlling. And, uh, controlling and uh, identify the target group. Um, yes. Okay, so that's okay. Yeah. I have one question. Sixty thousand checklist, which you mentioned. Yes. I have to say, I'm not sure. I know the aggregated data is uh, publicly available. So we have um, a dashboard where all the data is aggreg aggregated. I'm not sure if it's on company level uh, publicly available. Some kind of uh, yeah, it's it's aggregated per sector. You can you can make some different level of aggregation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And last but not least, uh, I'm pleased to welcome Marion to the stage, and we will come back to uh, the kind of debate with the first uh, the, the presentation by uh, on the, whether we we go for simpler uh, measurements or if we uh, manage uh, other type of uh, innovative schemes. Um, so Marion will present from the from two projects. The first one will be Sensei that uh, worked on the pay for performance scheme and looking at the US expense. And the new project that I have uh, the pleasure to call me that has uh, started December, but that's not completely new to you. That's a continuation of Entmo. Uh, simply named the uh, Entmo Plus. And she will tell you a bit more about that right now. Thanks so much, Sergio. Uh, yes, I'm Mario. I work with RAP, the Regulatory Assistance Project, uh, and uh, to them here on behalf of Ensemble Plus. So we are very happy uh, to be part of uh, this new project, which is very exciting, and I'm going to say a few words about it. But I'm also borrowing a couple of slides from the Sunset project, which uh, we were also part of, and which was a very exciting and forward-looking project. And I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. So just a few words about Ensmore Plus. I know a lot of you are familiar with it, but I just, um, for those who are not, um, so Ensmore Plus is a continuation of the Ensmore uh, project. And uh, the idea is to support the implementation of Article 7 slash 8 of the EUT. And uh, to do that, uh, the project uh, works with uh, public authorities, public agencies, stakeholders, uh, and um, looks at activities uh, covering the whole policy cycle from policy design uh, to evaluations. And we provide a number of services, including, including some uh, tailored advice, but also uh, more general capacity building activities. So I very much invite you to, if you're interested in these issues, to look at our website and subscribe to our newsletter. There's a lot of exciting events happening all the time. So we'd be very happy to, to count you. Uh, so now uh, coming to the topic of today, 
Uh, we discussed uh, this morning uh, a lot. We discussed different methods and different experiences with teams and measured the method savings uh, methods. And uh, what I'd like to, to, to look at now is rather like uh, future looking uh, policy developments that uh, we could be thinking about and that would be enabled by more or less new techniques uh, that are captured under the term, term uh, monitoring and verification 2.0. So, um, for those who are not familiar with this term, so basically now we, we, we have more and more smart meters and we have more and more data that we can uh, use from uh, this deployment of smart meters, but we are also in a better capacity to process a larger amount of data. And this uh, makes it possible uh, to make use of, uh, of uh, this new development. So perhaps not so new, but uh, fast evolving development. There's a lot of uh, um, scientific research going into that field. So this makes it possible to uh, investigate how this could uh, help define the, the future of some energy efficiency policies. So before going into some examples, um, just perhaps a couple of uh, uh, ideas of what a measured savings method could bring. Um, so if, if you think about methods or measured savings approach, uh, the idea is that they could, uh, they, they can allow monitoring uh, energy savings in real life and in real time. So this is something new uh, that uh, we can make uh, use of and that I think it's becoming increasingly important for decision makers, especially when there is a pressure to save energy very quickly. Uh, we know that uh, this is the case in many countries in Europe right now. There is a lot of scrutiny on assessing the effectiveness of energy efficiency policy right now. And this is a challenge. And uh, those new methods of measurement, they offer uh, this possibility to access data uh, a second point is that the data we get can be more granular in that uh, it can be location and time specific. And I think in the future, this will become increasingly important because um, as more and more end uses will be electrified, energy savings uh, will uh, be able to, to, to help us deal with constraints on the electricity grid. So more and more, we will be interested not only in how many energy savings are delivered, but also when they are delivered and where they are delivered. So uh, having a better understanding of that uh, will also become increasingly useful in the future. And finally, uh, the, the third point in this slide is linked to the, to the two, uh, two other points, is the way uh, uh, energy efficiency is rewarded. So when you have data on actual performance, it is possible to provide an incentive which is proportional to the energy that is saved. And this is based on real data. This is not based on deep savings. So there is actually an incentive for uh, real life performance. And I will come back to that point, but this is something that uh, um, has been investigated uh, by the, the Sensei project. So we have just a few words about, about Sensei. So Sensei ends it uh, very recently, it was also a Ryzen 2020 project, um, and there's a lot of findings you can you can find on their website. So Sensei looked at pay for performance schemes for energy efficiency. We collected a number of case studies from around the world, mainly in the US, but there was also an example uh, in Germany. Sensei also developed a business model that could be developed uh, for uh, applying pay for performance schemes for energy efficiency in the residential sector. And I think this is the, the really the important point of what the Sensei project was, was uh, looking at, that the, the, the developments we were thinking about were really linked to all these smaller projects that could be put together in a bigger aggregation of, uh, of projects that could be rewarded based on performance. And, and what Sensei did is that uh, Sensei also developed a methodology on how to account the savings. And here I really invite you to go and check the website. You will find a lot of information about this and uh, also a lot of literature. If you're interested in this uh, a more technical topic, it's really, uh, it's really 
a rich content you can find there. So um, in a nutshell, let's look at pay for performance schemes. So what is the difference between a pay for performance schemes like we can find in the US and a traditional energy efficiency subsidy scheme? So let's take a traditional energy efficiency subsidy scheme. Usually, the scheme relies on team savings. So um, we make some assumptions about the number of energy savings that are achieved by a project. And sometimes this uh, number is backed. I mean, very often this number is backed by looking at actual project and the, the number is revised uh, regularly to stick to reality. But still, the number is, is an average number that would apply to uh, all projects. Um, uh, and that is the, the, the value we are using. And the payment is usually a one-off payment that takes place when a new installation uh, takes place. So basically, um, this is the very common framework that you can find in subsidy scheme. You get you 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 give funding, and then that's that's it. There is no more monitoring of what's happening in the uh, project side. Now, with a pay for performance scheme, the savings are um, established by comparing. Uh, a baseline to measure energy consumption. And uh, here, uh, the challenge is to define the baseline properly. And usually, you need a year of energy consumption data in order to be able to be in a position to, to have a baseline where you can compare savings. And then, what's, what's uh, interesting is that the payment is proportional to the energy saved and uh, is delivered as the savings occur. That means that the payment can come with a bit of a delay only when it is established that energy savings have been um, achieved. Now, perhaps just a caveat about that is that in many pay for performance schemes that uh, we have reviewed as part of the Sensei project, the payment was not 100% um, proportional uh, to the savings. So there was always a grant element which would help the project developer to get into uh, the project. Also, another point is that uh, this proportional payments was something which very often would go to aggregators and the aggregator would themselves define the relationships they would have with the end consumer. And this relationship was not very often based on a proportional savings. So the end consumer had different, has different needs and the aggregator uh, was happy to, to go with this proportional payment, uh, but perhaps the end consumer had a different need at that moment in order to get into the investment. So a quick example that you can find more on the Sensei uh, website is the PG&E uh, uh, residential pay for performance scheme in California. So there it's in the uh, residential sector, there's a number of aggregators that have been selected by uh, the energy company PGE, and those aggregators are rewarded based on uh, the performance, the energy efficiency performance of a portfolio of projects. So it's basically a fleet of buildings. Uh, they're using the CalTrack method to monitor the savings. So it's an open source methodology uh, for method savings. The payment here is 100% proportional to the energy saved. The price is set in advance and um, uh, aggregators receiving monthly payment during two years. Um, now, what could it mean in the EU? So Sensei looked at what such schemes could bring into the EU context. So uh, I just, I copied a, a slide from the Sensei uh, final conference. And here, I think it's a very good summary of what discussions we've had during, uh, during the project. So uh, Sensei believed that pay for, performance, pay for performance schemes for energy efficiency could bring an improvement in uh, subsidy schemes uh, by making sure that uh, you reward projects based on the amount of energy savings they deliver. So it's about addressing the performance gap and uh, ensuring that you can um, you can reward uh, the project developer based on the installation of an equipment, but also based on how uh, the end users uh, is using this equipment and how the equipment is maintained over time. I think also what is, could be interesting is that uh, you could have the option of having measures that would uh, be a mix of uh, equipment installation and uh, uh, 
consumer engagement. So you could also tap into the fact that you have this relationship between the aggregator and the consumer in order to, uh, well, not only manage uh, possible rebound effects, but also uh, continue this relationship over time to ensure that the equipment is maintained and that perhaps all the uh, energy savings measures are taken in the same households. Uh, a second point of this value proposition was that um, the idea here to apply pay for performance schemes in the residential sector was that uh, uh, you would aggregate uh, small buildings project into project portfolios. And this portfolio, you have actually good understanding of how the portfolio will perform. Because perhaps one or the other building will, will not perform the way you planned it, but on average, your whole portfolio, usually you have good results, you know where it is going. So, and this idea of a portfolio helps lower the risk that you could have in looking at projects one by one and actually uh, have a more global view about this portfolio. And that is something that could be interesting for investors that are very much uh, looking forward to have good data and performance, but also they're looking at uh, bigger projects and interested by projects of a certain size. And then the third point that uh, Sansei put forward is the fact uh, that uh, with such an approach, uh, you would have the possibility to, uh, to demonstrate and uh, recognize and reward the role of energy efficiency in uh, um, as a great resource. So I think uh, in the US, the examples we looked at most of the time, they are initiated uh, by the regulator. The regulator, most of the time, what they are interested in is avoiding uh, grid problems. So that's really their driver together with the capitalization. And I think such um, a concern could also be coming in, in Europe uh, stronger in the, in the coming years. So now, perhaps just a few words about the fact that um, uh, measurement methods uh, can be used in other uh, areas. And we heard about some of them this morning, so I'm not going to go too much into detail, but we know uh, measured methods can be uh, useful at the moment where uh, it's about identifying the energy savings potential. So it's quite useful to understand actually what kind of savings you can hope for when you're going to support a certain action. They are quite useful for um, revising, uh, establishing and revising deemed values uh, in uh, energy efficiency obligation schemes and subsidy schemes, but they're also quite useful uh, as a method uh, to uh, the obligation scheme as it's the case in Italy. Now, um, uh, sometimes it makes sense to use dim savings, sometimes it makes sense to use uh, method savings, and I think that's also something that the Sensei project recognizes, that it's not that it's going to uh, replace all kind of, uh, of uh, dim savings approaches. I think they are complementary, but they can be useful to, to be looked at in, uh, in some cases, and they can bring perhaps some other ways of uh, looking at the problem. So before I close, just a few words about one what uh, NSMOF Plus uh, will be doing on that uh, matter. So right now we're gathering some uh, case studies on the use of measurement. So we look into uh, Croatia, France, Germany, Italy, and probably Ireland. And uh, we are working on that right now. We uh, expect to release uh, something in the summer. And uh, we're also preparing a webinar on this topic uh, for uh, to be confirmed that it could happen in September. So I very much invite you to uh, subscribe to our newsletter and reach out to us if you're interested and want to participate. And I just also wanted to mention another development, which I think is really interesting, is that uh, is, and it's something that's happening in the UK. So uh, stakeholders in the UK have been discussing the same uh, concept that Sunset was looking at, and they have been looking at how um, Facebook performance schemes could be used in the residential sector. And now there's a pilot scheme uh, that is happening. It's called Retro Meta, and they will um, actually apply this uh, method uh, on a number of buildings in Manchester. So it's really interesting. Also, don't hesitate to have a look at their website if you're interested in this topic. I think with that project and with that pilot, we will learn even more about uh, What's the interest? What could be the interest in a, in a more European context? So I think we, we can continue 
uh, the, the discussion we started with the Sensei project. In my presentation, you will find a, some readings for your train back home uh, on this topic. Um, and uh, with that, I will, uh, I will uh, invite you to engage with us again. You can find us on social media, and I hope to see you in future events. Hello, Marvin. So if there is no direct question, maybe I have a question for you. No? Uh, but we have a question. Are we going to work with it? Could have from Bancroft. And I was just wondering about the, the table performance. Uh, I think it's a good idea, but wouldn't it be because you also talk about the grid, the grid congestion and the fluctuations and things like that. So, so there will be certain times uh, during the year and the day that energy efficiency is extremely important. Wouldn't that be the, the areas to target them? Yes, very much so. And I think what we've seen in these uh, different projects is that um, uh, the, uh, some, some uh, places, I'm thinking about California, uh, the, the border between efficiency and demand response is becoming a bit uh, blur. So they are thinking about applying a different rate uh, for energy efficiency, depending on the time uh, the savings take place. So they're looking at the profile of the energy saving investment, and they know that some energy savings investments will, will, uh, will have more impact on peak demand than others, depending on the equipment you, you put. And they uh, calculate a higher rate based on, on that impact. So I have to say, I have to look into the details of that still because I haven't seen yet how it works in details. And I'm uh, also very much looking forward to the evaluation of this first pilot and how it's been applied uh, in reality. But yes, this is exactly where this is going. And that's why uh, monitoring the use of the equipment will become increasingly important, especially when. Uh, some equipment will bring uh, both energy efficiency uh, services and demand response services. So demand response services uh, might have an increasing value of the time. And uh, right now, uh, depends a bit on the market, how they are valued, but there is also this uh, problem that uh, smaller investments in the residential sector are not yet uh, really uh, rewarded for the, uh, for the capacity they're for the demand response uh, value they, they add to the system. And I think it's quite important to look at these two topics together. That's that my turn to make you work a bit, but that's uh, quite easy. So you have seen a lot of presentations today. Some of them are, not all of them, but some of them have touched the topic of the use of measurements in different ways. So we have, we have seen different ways. Uh, Interesting comparison in uh, ratios showing some uh, some gaps. We have seen how, how it has been used, but maybe also one reason to reduce the amount of satisfaction in Italy. We have seen also the, the performance thing. We have heard that maybe in Germany, two digital base codes, making too much measurement was uh, maybe not the best solution. So I I would like to see what is your opinion now on that. So uh, do you think that the use of measurement should be developed in your country? So you, if you were in favor, you just raise your hand. Not so much. So we, if we, we need to, if we want to promote the measurement, yeah. we need to take a um, But now we can open the call for last uh, open discussions. Uh, if there was some question that you did not uh, dare to ask uh, to the previous speakers, we can come back to it, or if there is a topic that more generally you want to raise. And if there is not uh, something that comes to your mind today, that one. Um, because you will, that, that might be a bit confusing what we have seen in this panel, I, I, I admit. We have seen different ways, very different ways to, uh, to promote uh, energy efficiency uh, uh, projects. But I, I will try to see how um, actually there are complementary approaches there. And uh, I think what you said in my presentation at the end was uh, very interesting uh, related to the experience in the US. Uh, that the, let's say, the, the, the main body promoted this approach of pay for performance 
was not the end user, so not the final customer, but the regulator. Because as you said, and uh, that was also in your question, the interest was in the reduction of pick order, let's say pick order savings, that kind of thing. So maybe what we see is that did for the, as uh, you just said, maybe from the point of view of the end users and especially the ones that are not so much into the energy data and so on, you should listen to their needs and that makes a connection with what uh, Laura uh, presented about the, the digital benefits framework and so on. But there are still uh, operators or some kind of organizations that are dealing with the energy systems and for them, maybe that becomes the, the way and maybe we could even think about the pay for performance approach to other benefits, not only to convince uh, the end, end user or customer that it's the right way to go, but maybe to get, if you, let's say uh, you might have heard already the stories of uh, getting a new boiler on prescription, but that uh, in the UK and maybe uh, in some other country right now, because the health insurance realized that uh, getting better in energy efficiency at home was a way to decrease the health costs. So, but maybe if you want the health insurance to provide money for that, you need to show that uh, there, there are the achievements. So I wonder what our panelists think about uh, that. So maybe I, I start with you, Manu, as a uh, performance team. So would you say that it could be used for other uh, indicators and uh, Yes, and I think that's where things uh, are going, or at least things were discussed in the UK. So uh, when stakeholders first uh, thought about developing this approach in the UK residential sector, they were very interested to collect data about indoor air quality, because this was an important issue in the UK, and they thought they could also value this aspect of uh, the work. So yes, definitely, I think then the, what we'll actually look for is perhaps very much Specific to the national and perhaps local context, but yes, there's a there's a there's really an interest to, to look at the uh, benefits here. Oh, you gave me not to crack here. Um, uh, well, I, I'm not uh, not to be misunderstood. I'm not against the uh, measurement myself, but because I think uh, basically we have uh, been part of projects where where. Energy management and um, teams have been developed. There, if you don't have real time measurement, forget about it. But this start is not, from my perspective, not so much in the residential, but more in the industry sector, so far as I, I see in the market. But maybe be also other opinions uh, also justified. But I think um, it depends. Uh, it depends where the value is. I, from, from my perspective, um, we still have the case as compared to the US that we have a grid team. So in, in Germany we have this grid team. So if you have a high load which you try to reduce it directly you have to impact by a reduced grid fee. So if you have a you need to analyze your energy costs and the grid fee plays a significant role over that. And it's not something which helps you to manage that. Because I think uh, the good thing with measurement and verification and good measurement is a good metering is that you can um, distribute your demand over time, uh, use your storage, you can use your building mass, that's technical right now, but then and, and you also can look at that and then you get the benefit of that, what you already have, with no hanging food investment. So I think this is worthwhile. So, but I do first of all at the value and where I can, uh, where I have the highest value for the investment. So that, that's would be my very simple answer to that. Very complex and challenging question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, I see the the paper performance approach is is really really helpful. And the question was then. Uh, how to use this approach for other benefits than which is saving. I see one you already mentioned that is uh, a different payment for different times for the same state place. So therefore you compensate for some kind of net stability issues also. I cannot imagine how you how we can how we could um, um, take into account also 
oxygen in the process. And uh, if uh, you're doing different times for the flexibility, then that you can also do it for different locations where um, plant species are more or less uh, or something like that. So, yeah, perhaps uh, in the long run, then we can see not. Sure. But yeah, no, but my opinion goes together with the predator of here and another opinion exactly that on one hand we are going towards uh for distributed generation and the community needs to need to, to measure everything because otherwise we cannot change the system, which is radically changing. On the other hand, the vertical benefits are indeed difficult to quantify. Not all of them will be, but I think it's necessary to do as much as possible, which is in fact what I what I would try to do. And we are also exploiting more projects beyond the ESME uh, to go in the direction of sustainability, also giving a value to the non agricultural practices. Um, just just a brief question follow the discussion with the two. I mean, basically, uh, the question is, you know, do you think that like uh, very accelerated advantages and technologies actually might help with these very complicated calculations because there is a mention of demand response on energy management systems. But today, uh, the chair of a working group on energy management systems is talking at this International Energy Agency conference on ISO 50001, and they're making connection with AI now. So they basically have something you know, which will be kind of totally sort of data driven energy management system. Because, I mean, we've been discussing energy management systems for like decades and even demand response for, for decades. So, it's been, does the panel agree, you know, that uh, accelerating technology changes will develop energy efficiency? Well, I have the microphone, so I start here. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the question. Yeah, I think the answer is yes. And I think it, it works both ways. So uh, in the innovation will accelerate the uptake, and the uptake will accelerate the, and push the innovation. Which is what happened, in fact, you know, all that has been done at European world level, and European level has pushed forward the innovation and energy efficiency and goals. And I think on the other hand, this can be definitely supported by AI or any other technology technologies. So my, my personal opinion is that. I think to add to that also, I think yes, it's a, it's a matter of time when we arrive at the situation where we really have a lot of data collected, enough data collected that we can go for. So, yes, <laughs> it's definitely what those methods are looking at. So, they're looking at machine learning and how you can really enhance the rapidity of the of the, the process in which you, you process with this data. Now you still need uh, people, you still need engineers, because you will always have this huge need to sort so uh, non-routing non -routing events, uh, things you need to correct, so you, you, you will definitely need people. Now it's everything's not, not just because you have the technology doesn't mean that it's gonna happen on its own. So you still need the policy incentive, you need the, the uh, regulators to be interested in those issues, and only if you have that push from policy, something will happen. And perhaps another point that I'd like to mention is that we need to keep in mind that in this um, in this uh, transition, we uh, shouldn't forget about those who cannot invest. So we have to think about uh, solutions that will help uh, low-income households make the investments into the uh, systems that uh, will uh, help them decarbonize and also pay uh, lower energy bills. So just throwing that out there. Thank you, Mario. And I think we can uh, give the last round of applause for our speakers. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Any other questions? And I hope that uh, all these presentation and discussions uh, will be useful for souls and maybe also challenge a bit the way uh, you were thinking before. That's the, the objective. And I'm very pleased to give the floor to our two uh, brilliant coordinators, Ivana 